Years ago, I moved from a very small town to a remote valley out in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by national forest and not many neighbors. It was just what I had always wanted. At that point in my life, I'd been a paramedic for about four or five years, and, being an outdoorsy, civic-minded sort, I decided to volunteer my services with a local search and rescue organization. For being such a tiny, poorly funded organization, we were surprisingly busy. In the nine years I was with them, we'd have at least one rescue every weekend, spring through fall. The source of the majority of these calls was the roughly 100 miles of poorly maintained fire trails that were very popular with dirt bike and quad riders. When they'd inevitably get lost or wreck and get injured, we'd head out, track them down, provide medical care, and fly them out on a helicopter, or put them on a Stokes basket mounted to a janky-ass trailer thing we'd pull with the quad. About two weeks after joining, and zero training beyond what I'd learned as a boy scout and medic, I got my first call. A group of dirt bikers from the city had lost a member of their party. For some reason, they'd put their least experienced rider at the back of the group of a dozen or so riders and took off into the woods. When they returned to the trailhead four hours later, the inexperienced guy was missing. They set out again and looked for him for four or five hours, then they gave up and called 911. The time interval from the initial 911 call until we had a squad assembled at the trailhead was pretty impressive, no more than 20 minutes, but we were already eight or nine hours behind the ball. We did a very quick briefing, distributed maps, divided into teams, then set off. They put me on a squad with the most experienced guy and we headed out. The plan was, for each two to three person team, to take one of the longer trails that ring the place, then after searching those, we'd systematically work our way into the shorter, maze-like trails that made up the interior. This was to be a hasty search, none of that grid search shit, just riding around looking for clues. I don't know what I had expected exactly, Maybe a few dirt roads through the woods or something, but these trails were an absolute nightmare. They were extremely rugged, technical trails, where you really had to know what the fuck you were doing and where you were going, or you'd never make it out. GPS rarely worked due to the rugged terrain and tree cover. Radios and cell phones were a shit shoot, and the maps didn't account for all the random trails riders would just sort of make. The only marked roads were fire breaks, and mileage-wise, those accounted for maybe 10% of the trails. Why this guy hadn't been partnered with someone or put in the front of the group is a mystery. Four hours into this, I'm caked with mud, bleeding from being hit with branches, exhausted and just fucking done. We take a water break and hear broken radio traffic that sounds like a bike has been found, but no rider. It's only a couple of miles from us, so we head that direction. When we get there, the bike is off to the side of the road, along with the quads of the other teams, but we can see them a few hundred feet in the woods. We walk over and find them looking down at the missing person, who is very dead. Lips blue, skin dusky, arms spread out like a cross. On first glance, his eyes looked to be wide open and solid white, but when I examined him, I could see that his eyes were actually covered with fly eggs. The guy had been dead for a while. It didn't make much sense though. His bike still had gas in it. He had water and food, and he was a healthy guy in his late 20s. Why was he dead? It looked like he'd simply laid his bike down, then ran into the woods to die. Mission accomplished, I guess. We wrapped him in blankets, then put him on the stokes and took him to the trailhead where a coroner was waiting. About a week later, I ran into the coroner and asked what the cause of death had been. The pathologist's determination was cardiac dysthymia second to extreme anxiety. The guy literally died of fright, which up until that point, I had always assumed was Hollywood bullshit. 
I've always wondered what was going through his head. Was he just afraid of the woods or being lost? If so, why did he run blindly into the woods instead of continuing to follow the trail? There's a part of me that thinks he may have seen something out there. I've heard a lot of stories about weird shit in these woods, and I've seen a few strange things myself, so it wouldn't surprise me. To start out, you need a little backstory to show how I got into this situation. When I got out of high school around 2003, finding a job was difficult, so I took whatever horrible jobs I could to get by. When I found a job cleaning fire and water damage full time, I was excited to have steady income and start saving, but this quickly turned into a nightmare that I had to endure for almost two years. The company I worked for put me on my first job which was a water damage claim, where a basement flooded with sewage. So after a few days of work, we finished and it was on to the next job. My boss then called me into his office the next morning and told me about a special crew that he was setting up and asked if I would be the crew leader supervising three other guys that were just hired. I found this strange as I'd only been working there for a total of around three days, but I figured my work ethic was already paying off and I would get a raise. I only made $10 an hour to start. Not only did I not get the raise, but I got no training in a new position other than a work van with cleaning material and the phone numbers for the three guys that were also hired in to do fire and water damage cleanup. The boss told me what tools were best to use and what cleaning products to use to sanitize, along with where everything was located in the van with hazmat suits and respirators, but he was vague about what kind of things I would clean up. He just said the situations were always different and I would get detailed instructions each job. He called my position CSC Crew Leader. The boss told me that I would never have to see the deceased as the coroner would have the remains gone by the time my crew got there and to use my logic to determine what needed to be removed from their homes and what could be cleaned. The first job I had in my new position, which the boss told me about when I got to the office, was cleaning up the remains of an elderly man or woman who died in their house and had been laying in their chair. When we arrived, the coroner had me come inside to show me a few things that were considered hazardous material and needed to be removed due to the risk of disease. I guess my boss knew people from the county coroner's office and much of the work came from their recommendations. Not only was the deceased still in the house, but was fully visible to me and the other guy, and you could smell the rot through the mask as the house had no AC, and this was mid-June. The coroner was backed up and waiting on additional people to show up to load the body as it was falling apart, and I called the body it because I honestly couldn't tell if it was male or female and I was trying not to look at it too long as it was disturbing. The other three guys I worked with handled it well, but two got sick from the smell and had to go outside to puke. We all waited outside after the coroner showed us the chair, the fluids that leaked into the carpet, and the basement where the fluids went through the subfloor and puddled onto some boxes in the basement. The coroner's support arrived and took the deceased out, and me and the crew started working. After about five minutes, weird things started to happen, the first of which was when I began to disassemble the chair. I'd removed the back of the chair and was putting it into the special hazmat bags that I was given, and the base started to rock when I was about ten feet away, putting the bag with the back of the chair by the front door. Nobody else was in the same room as the other guys were in the basement dealing with moving boxes. I brushed it off and took apart the base of the chair as much as I could, and when I got into the bag, I got a chill of my spine and began feeling sick. I just figured it was the shock of what I was cleaning hitting me, and pushed on, even though the chill was strange, as I was very hot in a full hazmat suit in June. Next was removing the carpet and assessing the floor to see if it would be able to be cleaned, or if I had to remove a section of the floor. 
So I called the boss to ask him, and he told me just to pour the special cleaner on the area to soak into the floorboards, and it would be fine. So I got it out of the truck where he said it was and brought it inside. When I got inside, all three of the guys in the basement were scrambling to get out of it, tripping over each other. All three ran outside. When I asked them what was up, all three said that there was someone in the cluttered basement and they assumed it was a homeless person or junkie. Detroit has many issues with these kinds of things. I listened at one of the open windows to the basement. It's kind of the first thing we did when we started working. Open any window possible, prop the doors open, so maybe someone got inside then, or possibly before we got there and was hiding. After listening for a few minutes and hearing nothing, me and another of the workers went inside, armed with a mag light and a piece of metal fence post, and we searched the basement. Nothing was down there except for the footprint of the shoe covers we used, but when we started up the stairs, we heard a horrible hacking cough from somewhere in the basement. When we looked for it, there was nothing, but the corner of the basement had a bunch of dust stirred up, kind of like someone was moving things very recently that weirded us out. We called the guys back in and they got back to the boxes, but all of them kept feeling like they were being touched while throwing away material from the boxes that had gotten fluid on them. I went back to my upstairs job, but found that the cleaner that I put next to the floorboards was gone. I started getting frustrated as it was the only jug I had of this cleaner, and I clearly remember it being sat next to the area before the guys ran up the stairs and got my attention. I began to take out trash, figuring I would find it eventually, or the basement guys took it for the floor. And I found it on its side, behind the bag that had the back of the chair. This is impossible. There were like six other bags in front of this one near the front door, and this was a gallon bottle of cleaner. Again, I got a chill, but this one was brought on by what sounded like a whisper that I could not make out the words to. I cleaned the floorboards and moved out trash. Job complete. That night, each member of my crew had a dream about an older man telling us that we're not welcome in his home touching his belongings, and that we need to leave. In my dream, I was alone in his house. The old man cried and told me I was destroying his things, and he couldn't replace anything. He was trying to push me out of his house, but it was like I was ignoring him. Even when he would push me and scream at me, no reaction from me. He then threw my cleaner into the garbage pile I had made by the front door, exactly where I had found it. Two of the three guys in my crew told me their dreams about an old man pushing them as they went through boxes of ruined pictures and other stuff that needed to be thrown out due to the risk of disease from his fluids. They also said it was like they had no control and were on autopilot. They said they were so sad but couldn't do anything. The thing that got me about the dreams of the other two guys was that they both said the man was getting so upset that he began violently coughing and that the man kept grabbing their arms when they would touch his boxes or throw things into the trash. Neither of the guys were in the house when me and the other guy heard the coughing from the basement. The guy that went into the basement with me said he had a dream, but all he remembered was waking up sad, like he did something wrong, and then had a horrible coughing fit, which might just be a coincidence, but I connected it in my mind as relating to the other dreams. We all talked about it and came to the conclusion that we were all just having a reaction to a situation and it was nothing more than our brains coping with what we had to do. I'm very into psychology, so I rationalized it the best I could and we hoped for better assignments the next day. The next few jobs were not so bad, cleaning up blood at a home invasion, no casualty but a huge mess. Then there were a few other bloody crime scenes with casualties, but nothing notable happened. About two weeks into the job, we began to learn the tricks of the trade, and we split into two different groups that I was responsible to manage as crew leader. So I would have to go to different sites if the other two guys had an issue or didn't know what to do. 
I thought I was getting used to the job as well as the other guys, as we had no other experiences like the first job, but I was wrong. The next job activity was of a middle-aged man that had ended his life. The coroner had already removed the body, but it was a mess. The guy had shot himself with what I think was a large caliber handgun or shotgun, as the spray was everywhere in the basement in like a second living room. There were skull fragments lodged in drywall, brain matter all over. And again, he was not found for a while, so the smell was horrible. The first step in cleaning this was using our backpack vacuum cleaner to suck up all the biomaterial. The coroner told us when we went in that he and his partner were extremely uneasy in the house and it felt strange and we immediately started getting a claustrophobic, suffocating feeling when we went into the basement as well. To make matters worse, the family of the man had come over and were crying upstairs but the vacuum noise helped cancel that out. While I was cleaning, the power to the lights went out, and it was completely pitch black. This was strange, because my vacuum was still powered. My crewmate started screaming at this point, so I turned off my vacuum and climbed off my ladder. I thought maybe he touched a wire to the lights, but when my vacuum unit was turned off, he was screaming, and I could hear things being knocked over. I started fumbling around for my flashlight on my tool belt and yelled for my friend, asking what was going on, but all I got back was panicked screaming. Then I saw in the pitch black something darker that was moving in my direction, and I will admit I freaked out. I slipped trying to back up, still looking in my belt for the flashlight, and found it when my back hit the basement wall. I turned on the light and aimed it at the blackest shape I've ever seen, and when the light turned on, I saw the shape of a man wearing a flannel shirt, beard, and an expression like he was about to attack me. Then, it was just gone. My crewmate was behind where the entity was, sitting on the floor, rocking with his hands on his head. When I approached, he picked up his flashlight off the ground and turned it on. Then he ran upstairs and outside, and then he threw up. I followed behind him, asking if he was okay and why was he screaming. I thought I just imagined the entity and the man, because his screaming scared me. But he told me that he was scrubbing the wall, and felt something pulling on something on his tool belt, and he thought it was me. But when he turned around, the lights went out, and he was engulfed by what he said was like dark smoke and he immediately could not breathe and was struggling to move. He managed to pull his flashlight out, but it was knocked out of his hand like his wrist was grabbed with force and he managed to scream. When he screamed, Trinket started falling off an entertainment center that was about three feet to his side, and the black smoke moved back, but he was close to passing out from exertion. He said he lost hearing, and he didn't know that any noise came out when he started screaming and that the stuff falling off the shelves was landing on him, and that's why he was covering his head. He said it felt like a weight was lifted off of him when the dark smoke backed up, but he felt sick right away, and the light from my flashlight made the sick feeling increase. We took an early lunch where he just sat there, pale as ever, and didn't say much other than he said he breathed in that smoke and didn't feel right. I got him some Gatorade and his color started to come back. I never told him I saw a man when I turned on my flashlight because we still needed to finish and I didn't want to put that in his head since he never mentioned seeing it. When we went back, the lights in the basement were on again. Half the things that fell from the shelves were back on the entertainment center and the TV was on baseball. There was also a different smell in the room, similar to burnt hair. My worker stayed a half hour, got sick again and went home for the day, leaving me alone to finish, which I didn't want to do, but I had to do as the other guys had their own job. After cleaning up everything with my vacuum, I began scrubbing the old blood, which is hard after it congeals. Mix in brain matter and it's like glue. 
even with cleaner. While I was finishing up, I kept seeing the shape of a person, always in the sight of my vision. Each time I would smell that strange burnt hair scent, and a few times I also felt like a force was pulling at items on my belt. I'm not sure what items, as there were several things on my belt. When I finished the job, I went to use the bathroom upstairs, and in the hallway along the way, I heard muffled crying or moaning. I froze up and stayed still, thinking maybe a family member had come back, and when I panned around, there was nothing, but I saw a picture on the wall of a man with a beard, wearing a flannel shirt. Several other pictures in the hallway of other scenarios of the same man. Different flannels with deer or fish or family. I'd not seen a picture of that man as I'd not been anywhere else in the house with a bathroom, nor did I use the bathroom downstairs, because pulling off the hazmat stuff is a pain. As I was securing the house, closing all windows, locking doors, and shutting down every light but the front porch light, I saw the front curtain move, and again, saw the darker than black form in the front window. The last experience I will share happened in mid-July in a very bad area in Detroit. There had been an incident where a guy supposedly tried to abduct a child, was stopped by people in the neighborhood who beat the man very bad, and he escaped to his house where the neighborhood people quickly called the police and civilians surrounded the man's house to prevent escape. The police response time in this area is horrible, and the people were throwing rocks through the man's window and damaged his car. The man was hurt bad by the mob, and was hurt by a rock or glass, and died in the home. From what the police officer told me, it was a misunderstanding, and the man picked up a girl that was injured riding her bike, and some kids that knew her told their parents that the man was trying to kidnap her, and people overreacted, and the man was brutally beaten. The cleanup was pretty simple to do. We secured windows, cleaned up blood and bodily fluid, but as soon as I entered the house, I just felt wave after wave of fear and sadness, like I've never felt this before, and it hit in waves that made my legs weak. My working buddy who was there showed up late, and didn't get the story from the cop like I did, but he experienced the same feelings I had. The whole time we were there, we saw a form darting around corners like it was watching us, then hiding. It was similar to like a small bit of fog or mist. We also heard very slight cries for help coming from several areas in the house, and also what sounded like, please stop, and a long, no. A few times the crowd came back and yelled at the house also, and when this was going on, the activity in the house increased and we could hear running footsteps go up the stairs. A door slammed, and it sounded like the front door would open and close, but we never saw any of the doors move. The path of the footsteps sounded like they came from the front door, through the living room, to the bathroom, to the stairs, to the upstairs bungalow room. The part that really got me was I could feel the floor impacts that felt like vibrations of someone running past me when I was cleaning the areas, and each time I would be hit by one of those waves of fear and sadness. When we left the house, there were a few people on porches hanging out like usual during summer, and the people were still hostile and yelling random things, but directed as us as we loaded the van and took off hazmat suits. We ignored this, but before we'd loaded the material from the house into the van and locked the house, the front door slammed hard enough to sound like a gunshot, which scared me and my crew member, along with the people on the front porch, to the point where they went inside. The front door deadbolt was somehow locked, and we could not get it open. I think it was a very different key than the knob. So we ended up leaving several boards in the house that were left over from boarding a few of the windows. The feeling of relief when I left the house was like night and day. Inside I was anxious, scared, paranoid, and just really down, which could be due to knowing the story. But when I got outside, 
It was like flipping a light switch. I immediately felt better, and me and the other guy in my crew were joking and laughing about dumb stuff and normal 19 and 20 year old shenanigans. I have many of these stories written down in detail in a journal I started after the first three months of working at this job. I talked to the guys on the cruise and got other strange stories from them too. I know that some of this could very well be formed by my subconscious mind to cope with traumatic situations, but some of it has no explanation. And when I hear other members of my crew tell me stories when they haven't been influenced by mine, that is a horse of a different color. The job got way worse when I started the journal after three months in. Several experiences with what I think was paranormal. Many situations that stressed my mental state to the point where my mask of sanity started to slip. In the end, I worked at this place for almost two years and of my crew, all died. Two took their own lives, and one from a drug overdose that could have been intentional, but we will never know. I just know that when these three guys, my age, around 19 and 20, started this job, all were normal, well-adjusted guys with no cares in the world other than girls, parties, and working. I watched each of them slowly drain their joys and passion for life, and I know this sounds bad, but each one that died was considerate enough to die in a clean way, most likely so another person wouldn't have to see the horrible thing that we all saw so often. My name is Rick Martinez, and I'm a retired truck driver. This happened when I was like 30 years old. I'm now 62. On the road, I see many strange things. I've told this story over and over. A lot of people don't believe me, but it starts off in Stockton, California, where I picked up a load of pipe. My destination was Salt Lake City, Utah. I was supposed to refuel in Barstow, California at a truck stop, but lo and behold, they were out of fuel. So I told my supervisor, hey, I got like half a tank of fuel. He told me to continue and hit the first truck stop I see. So 100 miles into Nevada, I see nothing but a sparsely lit desert with a couple of towns. When I noticed my gauge set was reading empty, I think to myself, that's not right so I took the first exit I saw and pulled over. I told my supervisor, who was right behind me an hour away, that I was afraid to continue on and run the tanks dry, so he told me to sit still and he would be by in an hour and we could siphon some of the fuel from his tank into mine. So I sat there, and I noticed that it was a small town with sparse lighting. As I sat there, I couldn't run the engine, so I couldn't listen to the radio. I sat there in silence. I don't do drugs, and I didn't make this up, so listen carefully. As I'm sitting there, I notice a lot of undone construction, a trailer park to my right completely dark, and a church off to my left about a block away with its lights on. It's about 2am, and I see this jackrabbit hopping around my truck. It hops around and just stares at me, and keeps hopping around. So I'm getting hungry, and I notice what looks to be a convenience store another block away from the church. So I get out of the truck and decide to walk to the store. While I'm walking, I keep hearing this dog howling like it's in pain. As I'm passing the church, two of the doors are wide open, and I hear clapping like they're having a service. I look inside, and there's no one except for the skinny white old man reading from the Bible and talking about hell. I don't linger too long and continue on my way. I then hear clapping again, and that's about the time the dog starts to howl once more. I notice there's a bunch of empty houses on the street that goes uphill. I'm still making my way towards what I think is a little mini-mart. All this time, the dog keeps howling. All the lights are on, 
and as I go inside, this little old lady with glasses is reading a book. There's hardly anything in this store. Maybe a few cans of food, a couple of bags of chips, and only water in the refrigerators. This whole time, the lady didn't even pick her head up from the book. So I grab a water and get some chips. I'm hungry as hell and there's nothing to eat. So I ask the old lady, is this all you have? Where is everybody at? She told me everybody moved out and new construction was supposed to begin like six months ago. She didn't say anything after that, so I paid her and walked out and started walking back towards the truck. The whole time, the dog is still howling. So as I get closer towards the church, I looked up the street towards where I heard the howling from. I decided to go see for myself why the dog was howling. The houses on both sides of the street are boarded up and dark. I saw a house with the lights on, with about a five-foot fence. When I looked over the fence, I was in shock. What I saw was a man in his underwear with a chain attached to his neck on all fours, howling. The hairs on my arms and neck stood up as I saw this other man burst through the back door and kick the man on all fours and was yelling at him to shut up. The man on all fours ran into a doghouse. I was in shock and turned and ran back down the hill to my truck. As I passed the church, both doors still wide open, but there were no lights on anymore, and I could still hear the clapping. Finally, I made it to my truck and called my supervisor. I reported what I saw. I told him to hurry up and get here so I can leave. My supervisor asked what exit I was talking about, and I told him. He said, Oh, I passed that. He had to turn around and come back to get me. So I'm sitting there, and the rabbit is still hopping around my truck. It stopped and looked up at me as I was sitting in my truck. I'm not saying the rabbit said it, but this is what I heard. Leave. I rolled up the window and waited for my supervisor, who showed up about five minutes after. I told my supervisor what happened and he just laughed at me and told me that he's going to drug test me. I did not sleep on that whole trip to Utah until I got to Salt Lake City. Believe it or not, I swear this is what happened. When I was 19... My best friend was diagnosed with stage 4 ovarian cancer. We knew her cancer was terminal, and she had a life expectancy of 5 years at most. Her and I would talk every now and then about passing on, and how even though I was healthy, I could always go before her in a crash or some other way. We made a pact that no matter which one of us left first, we would come back to the other and let them know that there was more to life after death. She eventually passed away from her illness at 22 years old, leaving behind her husband and her three-year-old son. She passed away on a Sunday at 8.20 a.m. I remember the call from her husband vividly. He asked me to bring her son to the hospital because she'd passed away. That day was a complete blur. I couldn't find myself to come to the reality that she was no longer with us. It all felt unreal. We were allowed to be with her for a few hours in her hospital room before she was taken away. But while we were there with her, I don't know. I was in complete shock, and my mind just couldn't process it. I didn't cry. Leaving the hospital was so strange, because at the time I had no children and my life revolves around my work, my home, and her. She lived a few minutes from my job at the time, so I would always leave work very early to see her, whether she was at home or the hospital. I loved her so much. I could never be away from her. So now knowing I had to go home, and trying to process I would never see her again, just threw my life for a spin. That night I couldn't sleep. I just kept trying to make sense of it all. In all honesty, I don't even remember the thoughts that were going through my head, 
but the feelings of loss and confusion were very prevalent in me. I couldn't sleep at all, but at around three in the morning, I felt the most beautiful and reassuring feeling I've ever felt. I felt what I can only describe as a warm hug take over me from head to toe, and I fell asleep. That night, I had a dream. In my dream, I called her husband to let me know that she'd written me a letter. He then tells me it's funny, because she left him a voicemail. He then asks me to read him the letter, so I read it to him. In this letter, she tells us how thankful she is that we were in her life. She thanked us for taking care of her and loving her. She asks us to please watch over her son, and that she's okay and no longer in pain. She also tells us that we will be okay. As I finish telling him about the letter, my mom comes into my room and wakes me up. She asks me for a pen and paper. I hand her a piece of paper I had and she starts to write. When she finishes, she hands it to me, saying she didn't know why, but something told her to write this and give it to me. When I read the letter, it was word for word what my best friend told me in my dream and she signed it with her father's last name. Now, my mom only knows her by her mother's last name. No one outside her close relatives and myself knew her father's last name, so I was very confused as to how she signed it with her father's last name. I asked why or how she wrote this. My mom didn't know. She just wrote. I explained to her about my dream, and she was as surprised as I was. I immediately called her husband and told him about the letter in my dream. He agreed they were all her words. My best friend came through with her promise. This made me a believer. I know there's more after death. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that. If you have a scary story of your own to share and you would like me to feature it on the channel, please send it to the email in the description. Or if you prefer, head over to my subreddit, r slash stories from Mr. Revenant. It's the stories that keep the channel going. Thank you all for listening. And thank you to my channel members and patrons. Jen. Joy. Handout. Pegasus Genesis. Karen Keating, V. Berry, LJ, Fiona X. Fox, Scott, I Like Booty, Monica Level Ace, Chris and Donna, Holly Spry, Kimber, Jasmine, Sanatix, Heather Haven, Kitty Cat Luna 2, ADHD Aurora, Janice, Cinderella Baby, Borderline Betty, Lady Dracard, Erica Nicole, Snowball Rathena, Melanie, The Honeybee 987, Pretty Girl 215, Ryan, Brooke, Wendy, Crafty Kel, Tina, Dina, Vampy Debs, Patricia, Amber, Krista, Brenda, Absinthe Alice, Christy, Kay, Spider's Web, Ooh La La Andrea, Sue, Monique, Sean Gorman, Emma Lisa, Sigma Cube X, Greg, Chelsea, Amanda Jane, Sam, Zep Tepe, Sarah C, Austin, Tegan, Lil Smart, Jenny, Gabrielle, Fire 05, Sarah P, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Monica Level Ace, and Alex. I hope you're all doing well, guys. I'll see you all on the next one.